Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Like I said in the introduction, I'm here with Lee Bratcher, the president and founder of the Texas Blockchain Council. Lee, welcome to the show. Ben, thanks for having me on. I enjoyed listening to some of the previous episodes and excited for what you're doing with this show and how you're educating the community. I appreciate the kind words to to kick this off, Lee. That's that's great to hear. Um, I appreciate it. It's good to see you again. I had the chance to to come down and join you guys for for your last event at TCU College. Um, so it's good to see you again. I think to to help us kick the show off, Lee, I always like to get the the background of my guests for the audience. I, I find that my you know doing a walkthrough of the background helps kind of set the stage for the rest of the conversation. So could you just walk us through your background, how it led you to Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and you know what precipitated the, the start of the Texas Blockchain Council? Happy to. Yeah, I uh, joined the military after college, went through officer candidacy school, and I've spent the last 13 years in the Army Reserves. Uh, the nice thing about the reserves is you can have a, a career simultaneous to being in the reserves. So um, at the current point, I serve as an innovation army uh, officer, innovation officer for Army Futures Command, uh, directly in 75th Innovation Command. And, and really, that's a lot to say that I'm a glorified paper pusher. And uh, I, I'm <laughs> supposed to be looking for innovative projects to help um, the Army to, to catch up with the Air Force. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> help the Army innovate and uh, be ready for the 21st century. So during that time, um, while I was in the reserves, I also worked as a political science uh, professor. And so I happened to be up at the Army War College researching um, property rights and political science and how that leads to conflict mitigation, uh, both sort of as a, in a dual hat role, but mostly in my, my capacity as an academic. And I discovered the Bitcoin white paper as I was up there looking into property rights and um, how that is a tool for mediating conflict and for mitigating conflict. Um, some, so some thinkers like Eleanor Ostrom and Mansoor Olson, who've done a lot of work on uh, collective action problems and property rights, it really dovetailed well when I read the white paper and thought, okay, this is just, this is a, di this is digital property rights that can be applied in the real world, um, unlike anything else that we've seen before. And so it connected uh, with me at that point and has grown in resonance ever since. Uh, and so three or four years ago, I started the Texas Blockchain Council as a way to um, liaise between the various industry verticals within this uh, growing industry and elected officials, regulators, and some of the sort of the established, uh, the establishment, if you will, kind of at writ large. So um, yeah, we've been, um, I, I left the job as a professor a few years ago as well, and I've been doing this full time for a while now and uh, enjoy the intersection of energy, politics, Bitcoin mining, um, and blockchain, you know, we've, I've, I've been way more involved with like ERCOT policy and regulatory meetings than I ever thought I would be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I feel like, you know, I know more folks at ERCOT than I ever thought I would. And um, that's become a really big part of what we do at the TBC over the last couple of years, especially since the interim interconnection um, issue uh, about 14, 15 months ago. Uh, but even before that, we knew that, you know, there, there was an all roads lead to, to ERCOT and to the, 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 the TDSPs, the utilities. So um, if you're not, you know, listen to your last episode or, or one of the last episodes that came out around um, utilities and that process being very political and a lot of mm -hmm. stakeholders and stakeholder management is something that is critically, I mean, that the guests got it spot on. It's critically important for what we do, for what the mining industry does in general. Um, so that's that we try to sit at that sort of that nexus of stakeholder management, uh, leave the the true energy expertise to our member companies. Uh, but we help manage other stakeholders, their expectations, 
um, educating them on what this industry can do for Texas from a job creation perspective, from grid perspective, as far as ancillary services and load balancing um, and, and frequency uh, balancing. And then also, of course, in demand response and some of the RRS programs that help or yeah. not, uh, you know, manage load. So, yeah, well, you're, you're touching on a subject that candidly, I am a little bit naive in, which is stakeholder management. Um, you know, you kind of touched on it. it. It sounds like it's a lot of education, but could you maybe just double click on what are some of the things that you guys do for stakeholder management? And, and then what, what are the results look like when you guys are, I don't know if doing a good job is the right way to frame it, but you know, when you guys are properly educating the stakeholders to some of these things like grid balancing, ancillary services and, and stuff like that, could you maybe just go a little deeper on that? Absolutely. The, the key to, for us and for any association or any, any group that's undertaking some stakeholder management work is building relationships prior to um, the, the rubber meeting the road, if you will. So we've been working to build relationships with um, colleagues in, within ERCOT, within the Public Utility Commission of Texas, within the legislature, the governor's office, uh, several of the larger utilities, um, even county judges and city councils. Uh, that way, the first time that we're coming to them with something that is potentially changing or an action that needs to be taken, uh, that's not the first time that we're meeting them. We've mm -hmm. already built a relationship. They understand what we're trying to do. They have a little bit more, uh, they have higher levels of comfort with who we are and our intentions. And then, then that conversation that said, you know, when we talk to them about, hey, we need to get you in a room with uh, this Bitcoin miner to talk about their concerns with their utility around interconnection timelines. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not like, hey, who are you? And why should we spend 30 minutes on, on that call? It's more like, oh, hey, Lee, yeah, uh, let me know. You know, my, I'm, my schedule's kind of crazy, but we can jump on a call with them sometime next week. Okay. Um, so it's really the, the first step is, is building relationships before any kind of um, stress uh, hits, yeah. hits the situation. Um, and then really understanding who, who the power players are, right? Uh, so if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And that's a phrase that I use often in the Bitcoin mining world because Bitcoin miners, you know, if if they could, and I understand why they think this way, uh, if they could, they would just say, hey, leave me alone. I'm going to sit out here in West Texas or Central Texas or South Texas or wherever. Uh, and I'm just going to, I'm going to mine. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be at my full capacity I'm not going to bother anybody. I'm going to create some local jobs. I'm going to do some good for the community. And um, that's what I'm going to do. But unfortunately, um, the way that the established industries have kind of networked themselves for not only in this ISO, but in all across the country, I'm sure, is you really can't. Uh, you really can't do that without kind of engaging in the politics and the power dynamics that are at play. Um, Cause this is, this is big business. And, and um, you know, even though it's maybe not how it should be, it's how it is. Yeah. And, and so that's what some stuff that we think about a lot is you know, who's at the table, where can they exert influence, where are their pain points um, and how can we navigate around that? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. It, I mean, it's it's just relationship management is really what that that comes down to. It sounds like, and making sure that there's no surprises for the large utility companies. I mean, just a, a prime example, and I'm sure you guys are very plugged in with XL Energy down there on on your grid system. But two weeks ago, I actually had an opportunity to meet with XL Energy, and not only were they very familiar with what Bitcoin mining is, but they were very familiar and aware of the benefits for their grid system. Um, and so went into that meeting where we were able to just get right into the, the meat and potatoes of the conversation versus an education piece. So um, I appreciate the, the deep dive there, 
Um, so we, you touched on it a little bit. Um, I'd love for you to just give what is the Texas Blockchain Council's mission and and how you guys are doing that. So maybe just go a little deeper on on your organization and how you guys are doing what you're doing. Yeah, we're a nonprofit trade association. So we're a 501c6, which is similar to a chamber of commerce. So we don't take um, donations. Uh, so what I'll say is donations are not tax deductible for a 501c6 because we get involved with politics. So uh, the statutes are written such that we are still a nonprofit, but we operate like a traditional corporation in that you know we have a p &L, our, our revenue comes from uh, primarily memberships and events, but other kind of content that we can create as well. And um, we, we, so we act, interact a little bit differently than what people most, you know, would think of when they think of a nonprofit that's like a, a 501c3 or a charity. Um, and so with Bitcoin mining, we found uh, some product market fit because it's a new industry. There is a lot of regulatory work that needs to be done, a lot of policy work and a lot of um, advocacy, lobbying and, and political work as well. And so that's been an area that uh, we've gained some expertise in over the last couple of years quite, quite rapidly, uh, mostly due to the fact that Texas very quickly became a hotbed for this industry. Yeah. Um, and I think anybody who's listening to the podcast probably knows that. Uh, I've always got to get my my jab in at Georgia here. You know, everybody's seen the <laughs> boundary uh, graph that shows Georgia with more hash rate than Texas, uh, which is a misnomer. And, and some people may also know this because Foundry is just utilizing data from their pool. And several of the uh, Texas Bitcoin miners are not on the Foundry pool. I'm not commenting on whether they should or shouldn't be. Foundry is a great pool. And they're a member of the TBC and we, we recommend people to use them. Uh, it just happens to be that a lot of the Georgia mining is on that pool and a lot of the Texas mining isn't. So that's why it looks uh, like Georgia perhaps could have more mining. In reality, Texas has more than 2,200 megawatts of Bitcoin mining. And wow. um, I am fairly confident that Georgia has far less than that uh, based on some of the numbers that I've seen. So just to just to throw that out there, uh, I think a lot of people think, how is Georgia the number one state in the U.S. for mining? And it's it's really because of uh, of that data. There's some anomalies in that data related to what pools people are using. Sure. Well, I I appreciate the 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 deeper dive into TBC and what you guys are doing, and and kind of staying on the the legislative, you know, topic here. You touched on it. Bitcoin mining is. It's big business. Um, I mean, these are big. I think, you know, for for people outside of my audience who don't know how much electricity Bitcoin mining is using, or maybe they've heard it in the news, it, it translates to big dollars. And there's a lot of legislation around this. Can you touch on some of the 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 regulatory framework that is in Texas right now that is, you know, either helping or impacting Bitcoin mining in the state? Yeah, there's um, some legislation from several sessions ago called the Texas Data Center Tax Abatement that incentivizes data centers in the state. Several um, Bitcoin miners take advantage of that uh, abatement. There's also Chapter 312 local tax abatements that uh, miners can take advantage of, assuming that the community, assuming that they meet some criteria on job creation and that they're um, you know, properly working with the county that they're building their facility in. Um, there are other incentives similar to those. One of those incentives is the ancillary services marketplace, really the energy only market that is ERCOT. Uh, and so Bitcoin miners are able to lower their net cost of power um, after, you know, looking into what they can, can do on the ancillary services market. So maybe they have a, a cost of power that's a wholesale rate of five cents, but their all in rate is 3.9 cents per kilowatt hour because they're factoring in a lot of activity, a lot of 4CP management, a lot of um, 
uh, well, that's probably a bad example. The wholesale rate might be a little bit lower than that. Uh, and then you've got to add TDSP charges, but those TDSP charges end up being much lower because of 4CP management. And then you're, you're able to um, monetize some of your energy optionality with the ancillary services. So a couple of different levers to pull, to pull there that um, allows for even lower costs. And so that's some, some of the elements on the policy side that, we're, that we think about. There is some legislation in this session that I'm sure everyone has heard of in Texas, Senate Bill 1751, which would um, limit a Bitcoin miner's ability to participate in Chapter 312 local tax abatements and limit Bitcoin miners to 10% of all ancillary services in, um, in ERCOT. And so we, we, that's been our primary mission of the last couple of months is to ensure that that bill does not pass and to educate legislators on, on that topic. And we have done that in a variety of different ways. We, we've launched a, a campaign that's garnered a lot of media attention. We've brought on Brad Jones uh, on retainer, who's the former CEO of ERCOT, um, recently retired. And, and now is helping us to educate staffers in the legislature about um, the industry and how it can be helpful. And I think he says it best, you know, when we, when we take meetings with different staffers and he, he joins the meeting, the, what he says is, hey, guys, I'm indifferent to Bitcoin mining and what it is. What I, what I care about is grid reliability and Bitcoin miners are the most responsive load on the grid. Um, and so it makes no sense to have them be here, but then prevent them from participating in ancillary services. That's the yeah. worst. Of, in his opinion, that's the worst of both worlds, right? He's like, if you're going to have 2,200 megawatts of Bitcoin mining here, they can actually go from a net drain to a net positive really fast. And so by limiting their participation in, uh, uh, ancillary services, you're really taking away that net positive, not not fully taking away. It's still it's still a net positive even without that. But you're really taking away one of the strongest arguments for Bitcoin mining in Texas or anywhere is is their uh, rapid response rates and their ability to respond to price signals. As yeah. Bitcoin miners respond to price signals, they're actually um, one of the few loads in the marketplaces or in the marketplace that can respond so rapidly to those price signals. The free market um, energy only marketplace that is ERCOT is set up for uh, loads and uh, generation to be able to respond to price signals. But really, for the last several decades since deregulation, only loads or excuse me, only generation has been able to be that price responsive. And so when you have price responsiveness on both sides of the supply demand equation, it, it is a, a huge net benefit for the grid. So um, yeah. that, that Senate bill, we, we don't expect that to pass. By the time the show airs, we'll know whether it has or hasn't. May 29th is the last day of the Texas legislative session. Um, so we've done a lot of work to ensure that that bill uh, does not pass. But we're also keeping our eyes open to ensure that... Um, that uh, some of the, the authors of the bill don't try to sneak that language into another yeah. energy related bill that's moving. Um, so, so it doesn't, it doesn't get attached on uh, as a writer. Yeah. Um, and for the audience where Lee and I are recording this episode on May 10th. Um, so, you know, by the time this airs, like he said, that we should have clarity on that. Lee, I'd be curious, do you think that Senate bill was, a byproduct of not enough education on how the ancillary services work? Or do you think maybe there were some people viewing this as Bitcoin mining is going to come in and completely gobble up all of the ancillary services that are even available because it's such a good responsive load? Like, they, I mean, they can turn off, you know, very, very quickly. And so they are kind of this perfect demand response customer, do you think they viewed this as well? This isn't going to leave any room for anyone else to participate? Or was it a lack of education? I'd, I'd love for you to comment on that if you can. Yeah, it's a little bit of both, right? It's 
the the staffers and the legislators, some of them are very attuned to ERCOT practices and, and the way that marketplace functions, and, and some are not. So it was a little bit of lack of education, but primary the, pr primarily the latter uh, point that you mentioned, which was, uh, and it goes back to stakeholder management, which you talked about earlier in the podcast. There are um, various groups that were able to extract a lot more value out of ancillary services before Bitcoin miners were around. And because it is a marketplace and people bid in the day ahead market um, into you know, what they can offer, what, what, what kind of services they can provide, and Bitcoin miners are, are bidding and driving that price down, then there's more there's more competition in the bids, which which is like I said, driving the price down. So people are either getting outbid or they're having to bid lower, which means they're not extracting as much value from ERCOT and from the ratepayers for their services. Now, I, I don't know which group um, or industry group or uh, which lobby brought this to the attention of certain legislators, but we do know that. Uh, from some staffers who, who informed us that a, a, an industry group came to certain legislators and said, hey, Bitcoin miners are taking up too much mm. of the um, ancillary services marketplace. And this was their attempt to fix the deck in their favor so that they could then uh, extract more value and bid higher. You know, I don't blame them for doing that, right? If you're not like I said earlier, if you're not uh, at the table, you're on the menu. So this is this is them playing the game and we're going to have to play the game back and, and just ensure everybody knows, hey, it is best for Texas consumers that miners be able to participate in this, not only for reliability reasons, but also for bidding down the price that ERCOT pays for insulin right. services. Yeah, well, and that's an excellent point and, and something that, you know, it's kind of a look behind the the scene, if you will, because I don't think everyone is 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 always aware of the fact that you know groups can come in and and lobby for this type of thing, and it's it it may have most of it to do with keeping their paycheck nice and large for those ancillary services. Where you know if you have a a, a large market participant coming in, that they'll drive that cost to zero. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Batteries, you know, there there's other generation like batteries and, and other marketplace participants that are going to start to drive those costs down. And so some of the established industries were interested in using their lobby power to pick off um, what they see as the biggest threat, which is Bitcoin mining, because we are so flexible. Uh, we're way more flexible than batteries for one reason. Batteries have a max like two to four hour uh, yeah. participation window. Um, and Bitcoin miners can turn off indefinitely. Like during winter storm Uri, they were off for several days. So um, there, there's a lot more to the equation with Bitcoin miners, frequency balancing, ability to turn off for longer periods of time. So um, it's, it's very unique. And this is the first time that this has really played out at this scale. And with these kinds of market participants and power brokers and players, so it's it's fascinating to be part of. I think one thing that bears mentioning is during this time, and I don't think it was concerted. You know, I'm not a, a conspiracy theorist, but during this this um, season of the Texas Legislature, the New York Times published what we would consider somewhat of a hit piece on Bitcoin mining. I'm sure the audience is very familiar with that. Um, I was quoted in the article. Uh, and and not negatively, just <laughs> oh, I was going to say, oh boy, yeah. No, I, I was quoted in the article, and and they didn't use the quote that I had hoped that they would use, or what they did. They kind of just made a generic quote from yeah. me. It was not um, what I had asked or what I had told them that they could quote me on. So I was a little disappointed on that. Um, but in essence, they're taking data and trying to show that Bitcoin mining is just bad. It's using. Uh, it's adding load, it's adding strain, and it's using um, more um, fossil fuel generation. And and really, they have a lot of holes in their data. And here's a couple of them. Uh, if you only use, if you use the regular grid mix, you're not accounting for 
Bitcoin mining that's taking place in parts of the grid where there's grid congestion. That's right. And it's really impossible to account for that without some really serious academic studies. Um, you know, we, A&M, I'm sure is, Texas A&M is a great place for this to happen. If you haven't checked out their blockchain energy consortium led by uh, Professor Lei Shi, he's doing some great work on this. They are an ERCOT partner. They do deep dive research far more thorough than what was purported to be done by the by the New York Times article. So they're not taking into account some of that location agnostic load and how it does appear to be taking a standard grid mix, but uh, that is a little bit different when you factor in that energy wouldn't otherwise have been used because That's it right. was yeah. stranded because of uh, transmission uh, constraints. The other thing that they're not taking into account is the fact that Bitcoin miners are bidding down what ERCOT has to pay on ancillary services. And that is a big expense that gets passed on to ratepayers. So while increased demand for power has the potential to increase um, consumer prices, it also increase, it also improves reliability, right? You can't you can't have one and not, you can't say, oh, this is bad because it increases prices. Um, but at the same time, this load is also increasing reliability. Um, and the price increases are mitigated. In fact, they could even be uh, a net neutral if you take into account the lower prices that ERCOT will pay for ancillary services. So there has not been a deep dive study that takes into account all those factors because uh, we're, what we're really doing is compressing the duck curve uh, as Bitcoin miners. We're shaving off the peaks and lifting up the valleys overnight and, and midday. Um, now, that's in extreme circumstances, right? That's in, that's in like the hot summer days and the winter days. But that's really when the, the duck curve is most severe. That's when you need the duck curve to be compressed. It doesn't really matter what the duck curve looks like on a nice fall or, or spring day. We need the duck curve to be compressed on those those high demand days, um, and it does help uh, generation when you pick up prices overnight, and, and that helps incentivize more uh, natural gas generation and therefore more more reliability. So what I'm saying is, if you if you had a, a study that was and it had some academic integrity and accounted for um, utilization of generation that was constrained by grid congestion that accounted for um, ERCOT, uh, the ancillary service marketplace and Bitcoin miners bidding down prices in that marketplace and consumers not having to shoulder as much of, a, of that cost, you know, because that's several billion dollars a year that ERCOT pays in, um, in ancillary services. And so if we can lessen that burden on, on ERCOT, that lessens the overall burden on ratepayers. So a lot of that is is very nuanced, and it just doesn't come across yeah. in, a, in an article or a tweet. Um, but it turned into a book. I mean, it yeah. would <laughs> it yeah. would turn into a book. It's, yeah. But it is the truth, and it's the fact. So that's why it's so important to partner with institutions like Texas A and M to to really get that data out there, so that policymakers can make informed decisions. Uh, absolutely, and I think you know, I think a lot of it. It's just the education. I think the more that people can start to understand all of this and the nuance, because the new, I mean, the, the devil's in the details and, and you have to know the details of all this stuff to be able to make informed statements, articles, et cetera. Um, so you mentioned 2.2 gigawatts of electrical use for Bitcoin mining in the state of Texas. I know that you guys have a lot of generation that that gets either driven into the ground or, you know, they're just through solar and wind and and, you know, things like that. Is there is there any concern that you guys won't have or that Bitcoin mining will outpace the extra electrical generation in the state? The beauty of it is that because of the market incentives, it, it never can. Right. So the mm. Bitcoin mining load that's being added, you know, the, they're doing their due diligence and they're incentivized to locate in places that have um, excess energy uh, because prices are lower there, uh, the, the, the nodal price is lower there throughout the year. 
Um, there, there is some interesting things taking place on settlement right now. You know, you see price updates every five minutes, but you settle every, uh, the average of the 15 minute span. And so if we can get that uh, to five minute settlement, then you'll see a lot more nuanced response from miners uh, during those like very short term price spikes. We also need to get um, a little bit more granularity for loads on being priced nodally rather than zonally. Um, that will help incentivize more uh, load at the right locations. Yeah. And by, by right locations, I mean locations with uh, excess generation and or transmission constraints um, because you want load on the opposite side of the constraint of uh, the opposite side of the population center or the power draw um, to help balance that out. So um, those, those two things will be very helpful, but even without that, you still have the price, um, the function that is a, is a great signal to Bitcoin miners. So why, even though you're seeing reports that ERCOT, you know, might not this summer is going to be record demand. I'm sure it will be record demand. We'll have record demand every summer for the next yeah. however many <laughs> years, right? We're growing, yep. we're a growing state. Bitcoin miners will not be part of the problem this summer. They have already demonstrated they're incredibly effective at uh, curtailing during high demand times. And it's not, again, it's not because they're altruistic. It's because they have a good price signal. And, um, and I would also say they are also good corporate citizens and good grid citizens. So that's part of it. But the general public doesn't trust altruism. Um, they trust economics. Um, and so we, we think that Bitcoin miners are actually going to be a larger tool in the tool belt of ERCOT this summer than they ever have been in any previous season, right? Yeah. And, and that's saying a lot because this winter, there was two storms where Bitcoin miners played a very large role in curtailing. And we had 96% curtailment um, in that Arctic blast over that December, um, you know, right around Christmas when that blast came through, we saw about 35% of the global hash rate go offline when North America got blanketed with snow, which just tells you how much hash rate is in North America. It's a little bit higher than people think. I think most people say um, 30%, but 35% yeah. of hash rate went offline during that storm. And that is probably undercounting because there is there's Bitcoin miners in parts of the the United States that just didn't have those same price signals that probably stayed on during that storm. Yep. Yep. Um, but in Texas, we had 96% participation. Uh, we curtailed, Bitcoin mining was curtailed right at the right times. If you look at the price charts, as soon as price starts coming up, that load, that load falls off. As soon as price comes back down, the loads back up. I mean, it's a beautiful uh, inverse relationship. And so, we expect this summer Bitcoin miners will play uh, an ever increasing role. Now we we don't want we want to get away from this language of like Bitcoin miners are saving the grid. Bitcoin miners are a tool in ERCOT's tool, tool belt, and they uh, you know we're not large enough to uh, take the whole grid on our shoulders and just fix it. Right? We we still need more uh, dispatchable generation, but we are part of the solution. Ba batteries are also part of the solution. We're a more cost-effective part of the solution than batteries are, um, yeah. but uh, that's for that's for investors to figure out and not for me to debate. Um, what what we are going to do is be a demand side part of the solution that curtails during high demand days. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And the public, the general public, should not care that Bitcoin miners are running at full tilt at midnight on May 10th. Uh, it, it, it is actually good for the grid. It is increasing uh, incentives for more generation. Yeah. It, is, it is picking up the tr troughs of the duck curve. The only time that Bitcoin uh, that the public should care about what Bitcoin miners are doing is uh, during those peak days uh, a few times a year. And, and it, increasingly, it'll probably be uh, a lot of times a year. It'll probably be um, as Bitcoin miners and batteries are more um, a larger part of the, of the mix, we could see this more frequently, but it's okay because uh, we, we want to see that this is a more efficient marketplace. This is a more efficient utilization of resources. Absolutely. So I, I expect this summer, you know, there will be countless occasions, maybe, you know, 20, 30 days when Bitcoin miners 
are an active um, are an active curtailment, not only for those that are bid into ancillary services, but even those that are just taking the spot price. Um, for those that are bid into ancillary services, oftentimes they have to remain on until ERCOT dispatches them. So you will typically see the spot the, the spot price takers turn off prior to any ancillary services getting called on. And now that varies depending on people's sure. economic. Um, but we have seen that before. And it also depends on which ancillary services bucket are they in. Are they in uh, LR, CLR, or, or some of the responsive reserve buckets, or are they in non-spin or um, reg up or reg down? I mean, I don't think really miners play in that world as much, but definitely non-spin and, and the, the multiple RRS uh, categories are are pretty common players. And it's really common for a miner to have part of their load bid into those. And the other pot part is just taking the spot price. Yep. We see that pretty frequently as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't even know what question you asked, Ben, but that was a really long answer. <laughs> I loved it. I, and I appreciate that. I, I was asking if, you know, Texas really stands to to maybe top out you know, as far as like Bitcoin mining, energy consumption versus what the state can produce. I think you, you nailed it perfectly. It's a free and open market and the pricing, you know, first and foremost is going to dictate to to miners where they should be locating. You know, if the price isn't signaling correctly, they're, they're not going to locate there. Um, yeah, so, I, don't think, I don't think we have infinite uh, appetite. No, like the market yeah. won't satisfy. So, it, so it's going to be a price signal. People aren't going to make the investment if they're too late to the party, right? If all of the the lowest cost uh, contracts have been purchased, the, the lowest cost co-location or the best best opportunities. Um, I think we, in Texas, we probably max out around 4,000 megawatts a couple of years from now. Um, that'll still be the large, I mean, that'll be massive, right? And That's I think, huge. That's, um, that's big. Yeah, that's bigger than most states. That's yes. more power than most yeah. states. So it's, it's really, really big, but it's not infinite. Yeah. Are you, I mean, there were a lot of eyeballs on ERCOT demand response and Bitcoin mining during those those winter storms that you referenced. Are you with Texas Blockchain Council, are you guys fielding or working outside of the state? to maybe start modeling. I mean, you guys really did set a, a very good example of how this can be used and leveraged. And, and I mean, 96% curtailment on 2.2 gigawatts, that, that's gonna provide a lot of power for a lot of people when they most need it. Are you working with other states, other groups, other, other grid systems to maybe map this out to, to expand out of Texas? Well, we do share best practices with several other state associations. Um, I would say each each ISO is different, and so while you know the true expertise here is, doesn't lie with within um, within the TBC, right? We are a stakeholder. We, we're we're an education advocacy group, and we bring stakeholders together. We're a connector. The true expertise is with. Um, the grid operator and the utilities. So I do know that the, the experts within the grid operator and utilities are having conversations with other um, subject matter experts in other ISOs. And we, we've helped to facilitate some of those conversations and sometimes they happen organically, which we really uh, appreciate and are, are glad that that's happening. Um, so that's really where I think the information sharing needs to take place. I mean, my my knowledge of this is deeper than 99% of the general public's, but it, it pales in comparison to the people that have been in the power markets for 20 years. Sure. Um, so what we, we, we just have these relationships with deep, deep subject matter experts that are so deep in their subject matter expertise that they have very little network. And yeah. so we're able to connect them or, or maybe put the pieces together and then we let them do their magic. Oh, okay. I appreciate that. I, I, I just, I'm excited by the fact that you guys are setting such a, a good and clear example for how powerful um, Bitcoin mining can be. Because as I'm having these conversations for the podcast and, and, and in my work, 
I'm finding that this is becoming more and more just an infrastructure and utility conversation and that it's it's almost moving beyond bitcoin and bitcoin mining this is it's just a tool um so i appreciate that i'd love to maybe start to go into more of the like economic side of bitcoin mining especially in texas what what role are you seeing for bitcoin mining in the broader texas economy is this, I mean, as far as like job creation and economic incentives, could you maybe touch yeah. on that too? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one that we lead with pretty frequently when we're dealing with elected officials and we're working with them because they understand job creation and tax revenue. And um, Bitcoin mining is is creating a lot of jobs contrary to public opinion, right? When you When you put a 200 megawatt facility somewhere, you create a lot of jobs. Now, you may only be manning that facility with uh, three shifts of eight people a day or six people a day that are actually doing data center management, um, but you've created security uh, jo uh, officer jobs. You've created um, a huge increase in demand for trade skills in electricians and plumbing. And beyond just the construction phase, a lot of this stuff is um, continual. I mean, the construction phase is certainly plussed up. But when you talk about maintenance, maintenance and other things, you, you need a continual job base. So we've seen 2,000 direct jobs created in the state of Texas by Bitcoin mining. And more importantly, 20,000 indirect jobs. So that can That's be contract great. jobs, that can be jobs that are sort of on the periphery, uh, excuse me, on the periphery of the industry. Um, and so we also see that Bitcoin miners are in the top employer in two Texas counties and um, the second top employer or the second largest employer in another two Texas counties. So um, very, very good for rural Texas uh, yeah. and for, for probably, we have 254 counties in Texas, so quite a few, but there's about 10 Texas counties that have really benefited from um, large scale facilities being located in their county. Um, and so, once, once we have more data on the tax side of things, we'll also be able to tout those numbers as well. But Bitcoin miners pay franchise tax. Um, they pay, uh, well, some of them pay sales tax, depends on it, how large their facility is, how many jobs they created and what kind of abatements they were able to get. Uh, but they, they all pay sales tax. They all pay uh, employment tax. You know, they're all paying uh, for their employees. Uh, there, there's, property taxes in most situations, sometimes that gets abated a little bit, but in, in nine times out of 10, there is a, uh, a property tax obligation. So once we can amalgamate all of that information on the tax side, we'll have um, another powerful story. But on the job side, it's immediately clear when you go into a county that say has 10,000 people and only 4,000 of those people are employed because the other 6,000 are either retired or, or school aged or, you know, out of work, right? Yep. Uh, the labor force participation rate in some of these counties is, is lower than the national average. Um, that, that is a trajectory changing development for a county. And um, when we can tell those stories and bring those people that were formerly making you know ten dollars an hour doing xyz odd job and now they're making 25 dollars an hour with yeah. health benefits yeah um that changes the course of that family that that could change uh the trajectory of multiple towns within a county i mean those are the kinds of stories that we're trying to tell um and that i think they do take a little bit of time but i'm excited to tell them yeah it's it it really feels a lot like you know if you look at the rust belt states and and what you know those states were like in the heyday when the big car manufacturers were there when the big mining operations were there i mean those were booming thriving this really reminds me of some of that where where bitcoin mining is coming to these because we're, we're seeing it up in minnesota we're seeing it up in the midwest in general um same type of thing where this this industry comes into small counties and small towns and you know they're taking on quite a bit of work compared to the the general labor pool there. So it's it's exciting to see. I want to be respectful of time and and make sure that we're we're watching the clock here. 
Lee, I think we could keep going on and on. Um, I'd love to maybe get your thoughts on advice for aspiring Bitcoin miners or entrepreneurs looking at this space in this industry. What advice would you give them just to, to either get into the industry or be involved in the industry? Um, and then, you know, maybe just wrap that into Texas and everything that you guys are doing. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would say if you don't have a background in energy, don't tr try to start your own Bitcoin mining company. Um, go, go work for a Bitcoin miner. Um, in, in, unless you're just excellent in capital markets or energy, those are the two uh, skill sets that Bitcoin miners really need. The, the, the best place to start is going to be with an established company. Um, if you do have those expert, those areas of expertise, then you're probably already thinking about it. And you probably already have a, um, your competitive advantage and you're, you're diving in. That's awesome. Uh, but for those that don't have those backgrounds, there are a lot of great jobs with the existing miners where you can move up the ranks really fast. And maybe it's not as glamorous as, uh, you know, starting your own Bitcoin mining company, but it is... Um, perhaps a faster way to gain that expertise and to learn some of the lessons that other people have learned um, before you have to, to yep. experience those yourselves the hard way. Um, and, and I would say for Texas in particular, you know, there, there are a lot of people that think about this more than me because I'm not a miner myself, uh, although I'm, I do personally mine with a couple S 19s. I'm not a, an industrial scale Bitcoin miner, but what I've been hearing from those that know the market well is um, the low hanging fruit has been picked and it's really uh, incumbent on the, the site location um, identification business development folks that are, that are going out and doing that to, to really network and liaise with generation assets and, and look at those co-location sites. Um, there's a lot of um, what, what I'll call like smaller opportunities in the five to 50 megawatt range that are utilizing stranded energy um, and not stranded natural gas. I'm talking about stranded uh, generation. Yep. That again, may not be as glamorous as the 200 megawatt standalone site but are going to be far more economical. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, that advice is outstanding. I, I think you, I really appreciate that, that because that's not like the typical advice where it's like, well, just get into the industry. You know, it's, hey, take take your time and, and get into it strategically. Um, yeah. I think you're right. The lowest hanging fruit has been picked. And so now it's, you need to really have a competitive advantage or really know these markets to go and start your own. So I, I think that's phenomenal advice, Lee. I want to make sure I'm also giving you a chance for, for a handoff. I want the audience to be able to get in touch with you and the Texas Blockchain Council. Um, so please give a, a handoff for how they can get in touch with you and, and your, your organization. Yeah, I, I'm on Twitter at Lee underscore Bratcher and people can email me at Lee at texasblockchaincouncil.org. Um, I will connect you to whoever on our team is, you know, your question or inquiry is about, and uh, we can, we can uh, help you in, in whatever. So th there's a number of different ways that we try to help people, right? We, we try to help people that have inquiries, but we typically uh, have to spend our time, the bulk of our time and resources on our members. So um, that is, that's just how business works. So. Yep. If uh, if there's a company out there that is not yet a member of the TBC and they uh, are looking for more than just like a an introduction, they're looking for uh, us to st think strategically with them and introduce them to multiple parties, uh, then we would ask that they become a member before um, we do that. But uh, we're 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 out there to be a connector, and so that's that's what we're trying to do, and happy to help connect people on on all fronts, and then. We'd love to see people at the summit too in uh, November in Fort Worth. Great. Lee, really appreciate the conversation today. Always good to, to see you and chat with you. Um, yeah, well, thank you again and uh, you take care.
Awesome. Thanks, Ben.